Hello and welcome to chapter number seven of this lecture series on CCNA4 with me, Joachim Scherestad from the University of Skövde. Uh, what we will talk about today is basically uh, called Network Evolution by Cisco and it will be a little bit about IoT, cloud and virtualization, uh, network programming, some bits and pieces of how the networks has, uh, has evolved uh, since the start and up until now and a little bit about what we think about the future as well. So uh, I've actually made this lecture a little bit dense. There are a few or, or quite a lot of Cisco specific points and Cisco specific uh, technologies and services. I've decided to just delete all of those. Uh, also, it's a little bit uh, of a mix between uh, what I think about the world and what Cisco thinks about the world, which is not always fully compliant. So uh, if you necessarily need to, if you're watching this video as a lecture that is given as a part of a course at somewhere else than the University of Kvevda, you really need to uh, make sure that you grasp the differences between what I say and what Cisco emphasizes in, in, in the reading material. Uh, so let's just get going with this lecture, which is second to last, so we're soon done with the CCNA material. And what we will begin with is Internet of Things. And well, uh, there has been uh, uh, there has been a large involvement uh, of what the internet is, and I think that this is quite interesting to contemplate uh, because well, internet is to a very large extent based on ARPANET, which connected a few uh, sites back in six, uh, 1969, and now we have billions of billions of things that are connected to the internet. It's predicted by Cisco that 50 billion things will be connected to the internet. Uh, by 2020 and we've seen an evolution where we started off by having a couple of computers to having lo large local area networks with servers and stuff to virtualizing stuff to uh, connecting cell phones to now connecting everything uh, basically so we're connecting our fridges we're con connecting i have i have my lamps at home connected i, I can control the the um the engine heating heater of my car from my cell phone using the internet and all of those uh, nice things. Um, quite a fun story that I heard about was that it was actually a denial of service attack that used, uh, used a weakness in, uh, in aquatic pumps or pumps for aquariums to take over those pumps and use them in a denial of service attack. So well, even the pumps for our aquariums can now be connected. Um, and we called this evolution, well, first we had bring your own device technologies that was more interested in how we handle uh, private devices that comes into our networks. And then we had talked about Internet of Things, I guess we still do, but now we really talk about the Internet of Everything. So everything should be uh, connected and more and more stuff will get connected. And this puts some interesting demands on security bandwidth and interoperability, performance and all of that. Uh, so something that we should know is that networks will will converge to to be on the uh, on the network infrastructure. And there are still many unconnected special purpose networks that are active in, for, for instance, smart homes. Even if those are uh, basically basically converged, so that they are in in, in now. Uh, modern cars have their own networks that will. Uh, will surely get on the internet. We have heating and cooling systems that may have uh, networks on, of their own. We have lock systems for uh, apartment buildings and so on and so forth. And these networks are converging into the network infrastructure, giving us a lot more devices that we need to handle. So that was a little bit about IoT. And now we will make a uh, swift uh, context switch into cloud computing. Uh, I'm going through all of those concepts in very brief because I well I do think that if we should talk a lot of the, uh, a lot about them we should give them a course of their own rather than just uh, look at some uh, concepts in detail. Uh, so I'll just give you a very abstract overview. And well, when we talk about cloud computing, it's basically about putting your compute on someone else's computer that happens to be much bigger than yours. Uh, usually you uh, give it, uh, give all your data to like uh, Amazon, Google or Microsoft and have their cloud run everything and just hope that cloud act or, uh, or the European equivalent or the European law, GDPR is the name of it. I should know that better than Cloud Act, but apparently I don't. Uh, putting it on, uh, you put your data on some other cloud, uh, on someone else's computer and you hope that Cloud Act or 
uh, GDPR won't bite you in the ass. I'm not sure if that's the truth, but uh, I'm actually quite opposed to cloud computing, come to think of it. Um, however, uh, when we talk about cloud computing, uh, there are three main cloud computing services defined by the National Institution Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, and their special publication 800-145, and those are the following. Uh, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service, where uh, software as a service is basically where a cloud provider is responsible for access to services such as email communication uh, or whatnot, uh, Office 365 um, or Gmail, those are software as a service um, cloud services. And the only thing that we need is to provide for provide some data and we can access those cloud services. Then we have platform as a service and this is when the cloud provider is responsible for access to well the development tools and services used to deliver applications. Uh, I guess you could say that uh, um, that uh, what is it called Azure is a uh, is a platform as a service because you can buy access to a uh, to a server and you can do whatever you want with that. Uh, and then we have infrastructure as a service, uh, which is where the cloud provider is responsible for access to networking equipment, virtualized network services, supporting network infrastructure, and basically everything. I, I, I guess that looking into platform as a service or infrastructure as a service, those are uh, quite tightly integrated and you can have more or less of one or the other. And something that's grown in popularity and something that I am like is that you can use clouds in different ways. I mean, we can use cloud, cloud topologies or cloud the cloud way of thinking without giving any uh, all our data away to a third party provider. Uh, we can have our own cloud or we can have community clouds and so on and so forth. So there are actually four different models of clouds that I want to uh, discuss a little bit. Public clouds, private clouds, hybrid clouds and community, community clouds. Uh, and public clouds uh, is basically uh, clouds that are offered by uh, some organization, uh, cloud-based applications and services that are offered uh, to the general population. The services can be free as with Gmail or offered on a pay-per-use uh, model. Uh, for instance, if we pay for online storage or uh, if we pay for space in the uh, on Azure or whatever. Uh, but we can also have private clouds. And with private clouds, we, we basically uh, run the cloud ourselves. So it's basically about uh, running services that are uh, that, that are given to uh, the persons in our organization using the internet. So for instance, we can set up a private cloud on our own private network and then have our users access it uh, using the internet. Uh, of course, we can have private clouds that are a or hybrid clouds. Sorry, that is a combination of the clouds that we just talked about. So uh, part of the cloud may be private and the other one may be public. Uh, I guess we could, as a hosting company, have a hybrid cloud where parts of it is private to for our own use and part of it is something that is public and that we offer as a service to our customers. Uh, the material also talks about community cloud, uh, which is a cloud that is not a private cloud, but it's a uh, semi-private, you could say. Uh, for instance, you could have a cloud that is created for exclusive use by a specific community, like a university cloud or a healthcare cloud or, uh, or such. So that's what I wanna say for clouds. And um, next I want to, uh, take a few words about virtualization uh, that is very common in modern networking um, and uh, you sometimes use cloud and virtualization inter interchangeably but it's uh, essentially different things even though virtualization is basically the foundation of uh, cloud computing. Uh, but in essence, you can say that virtualization is about separating the operating system from the hardware. Uh, and what happens is that when you use virtualization techniques, you can run several different virtual servers or virtual operating systems on, on the same uh, hardware. And this is in contrast to traditional unvirtualized environments where uh, basically every server had its own hardware. Uh, it was common to have one service with one operating system for each service. Hardware resources was not optim optimally used in this way because maybe you had some very tiny uh, service like NTP and you had one uh, large and uh, uh, large and demanding service like a well-used web server. Those still needed to have a machine, uh, one machine each. Uh, 
uh, if you look in the Cisco material. Of course, you could have them on the same machine if you wanted to, but whatever. Uh, what I want to emphasize here, I guess this could be a question if you do a Cisco test, is that each server does become a single point of failure for the services that it, that it runs. So let's look a little bit more into detail uh, about how virtualization works. And basically what you do is that you have your hardware servers, but instead of uh, but instead of installing a traditional operating system to the server, you install a hypervisor. And then on top of the hypervisor, you can install any number of operating systems. So you can have, like in this case, two different service, uh, servers that run uh, four operating systems each. And then on top of those operating systems, you have the services that you want. Uh, so what are the benefits with using virtualization? Well, uh, essentially, you can consolidate your resources from many different hard, uh, machines into one or a few more powerful machines, uh, meaning that you need less equipment, you need less energy, you need less physical space, which is a, a problem. You will generate less heat, so it's, it becomes easier to build server rooms. Uh, you actually get improved disaster, re uh, disaster recovery and backup possibilities because uh, it's quite easy to uh, move virtual machines between hypervisors. Uh, it's commonly quite easy to just export a machine and store it as a virtual hard drive or a file somewhere. Uh, and then you can just import it again if, if, if it goes down. You get faster server provisioning because you don't need to go through all of this phys these physical steps of ordering uh, a machine, uh, putting different hardware into it, mounting it up into a rack. Uh, you can just press a button in the virtualization uh, platform. <coughs> Sorry, that says that you need a new machine. Uh, you also get better resource usage because any proper virtualization and uh, hypervisor will give you options to share resources in a dynamic way. So uh, if one machine needs more resources than another, it will basically take resources. So you'll have a dynamic resource allocation. Um, and uh, there are more benefits as well if we want to go on. So let's look just very briefly on the virtualization architecture. So when we are talking about uh, computers, we, uh, basically we have hardware. So we have CPU, we have memory sticks, we have uh, network interface cards, we have hard drives and so on and so, so forth. Then we have some firmware and then not looking at the hypervisor step right now, we have some operating system that runs some services. Um, when we work with virtualization, what happens is that we take a middle step. So we put a hypervisor in between the firmware and the operating systems, and we can run multiple operating systems on top of, uh, of, of that hypervisor. Uh, when we talk about hypervisors, we talk about two different types of hypervisors, type one and type two, um, where a type two hypervisor is actually, as you see in the picture here, installed within an operating system. So then we have our computer as we are used to, our personal computer, we can install a hypervisor into that. So we still have everything as it was before, but we also have a hypervisor that we can have other operating systems on, on top of. So this is how I use virtual, virtualization in, on my desktop in my office. I have my, my Windows uh, 7 actually machine that I'm forced to have by the university IT department. No hard feelings, I kind of like Microsoft, but uh, where I can install a type 2 uh, hypervisor in there so that I can have access to Linux or Unix OS uh, whenever I need to. Uh, the other version is type 1 hypervisors and in this case I installed the hypervisor directly on top of the hardware. This is the common way for server environments. So I have a server that, uh, with the server hardware, then I installed the hypervisor on top of the hardware and then I can uh, directly and manage the hypervisor using some kind of uh, management console and install different operating systems on top of the hypervisor. So a few ending notes on virtualized networks, uh, because just as you can virtualize uh, servers, you can and well usually have a need to virtualize uh, virtualized networks so that you have virtual networks. Consider, uh, consider a server 
or a virtualization platform where you have like 20 different servers. Of course, you need a proper network to connect them in the way that you want to. And well, virtual networks lets you build networks uh, in virtual environments. Any, uh, any proper virtualization platform will do this. And uh, you'll have routers and switches in there and configuration may of course differ, differ between vendors, but the fundamental concepts uh, are basically those we discussed in CCNA courses, but instead of working with a physical Cisco switch, you may have to work with a VMware um, virtualized switched. Whew. So moving on, I feel that we go. I, I feel like we're going in super speed, uh, and still I've spent 15 minutes already on this lecture, and now we're going into the magical realm of software-defined networking. Uh, so basically, you should forget everything you learned about networking because it so happens that the future is here. Or maybe not. Um, but software-defined networking or network programming or whatever you want to call it um, is uh, a new way of thinking around networks that is gaining in popularity. And I want to hold you right there because now you're thinking, okay, so all of this CCNA stuff was just, um, was just a waste of time. Well... Uh, the protocols that are in the foundation is still going to be the same, but but it is uh, it is very likely that we will configure networks uh, in a different way in the future using uh, programming or using a different interface where we may maybe not spend so much time with every device. We do everything from a central plane instead. Uh, so talking about software-defined networking, it's basically about separating the intelligence and the muscles of networking devices. Uh, networking devices can be divided into a control plane uh, where forwarding decisions are taken, address tables are managed, and so on and so forth. And then we have the data plane that is used to shuffle or forward traffic. So if we look at the architect architecture of SDN in in two pictures, we have the traditional architecture to the left where every device has a data plane or and a control plane. But using uh, the software defined networking architecture, we abstract the control plane of each device and put it on a controller. So we basically uh, do all the calculation, uh, all the heavy calculations from one device. And then we let the networking devices do what they do best, namely shuffle traffic. And there are a few different types of software-defined networking, of course, uh, beginning with device-based software-defined networking. Uh, and in this type of SDN, the devices are programmable by applications running on the device itself or on a server uh, in the network. So this is basically about uh, programming uh, the devices. Uh, and depending on who you talk to, you can, well, you can have your own definition of SDN if you want to. Uh, but if you look at uh, any networking device, there is an uh, there is an API, so you can program it uh, remotely instead of having to input commands directly to it. And I guess that would be the type of the device-based SDN. Uh, we can also have controller-based SDN, and in, in this type of SDN, we would use a centralized controller that has knowledge of all devices in the network. Uh, the applications uh, can interface with a controller that is responsible for managing devices and manipulating traffic flows throughout the network. And what this gives us is a controller that holds the intelligence of the network. So we can have stuff like dynamic routes depending on traffic loads. Uh, we can shape our traffic so we will utilize different routes in the traffic. Uh, for instance, if we see that there is congestion occurring in one part of the network, maybe we can uh, avoid going through that part of the network uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have policy-based uh, SDN, which is similar to control-based SDN. Um, but the policy-based SDN will include an additional policy layer that, that basically operates at, at a higher level of abs as abstraction. Uh, and it will use built-in applications that can automate advanced configuration tasks uh, with guided workflows and use user-friendly uh, graphical users, user interface. Uh, this is a nice turnover to talk about Cisco APIC EM, which is an example of this type of SDN. But being true to my words in the beginning, when I, when I stated that I won't spend too much time talking about Cisco-specific stuff, I am not going to do that. So that concludes this lesson. There is no packet tracing material for this chapter. Uh, when we end, we will summarize the course by talking about uh, some troubleshooting and we will actually end everything in a context-based microtraining way with a troubleshooting exercise. 
So see you next time for the final lesson, lesson number eight, uh, and have a good day until then.